Hey guys, welcome back to my channel and welcome to another Where Is video. I know it's been a long time since I posted a video. It's been a couple weeks now. I've been really busy. I'm working on some really cool stuff behind the scenes that I plan to post on my channel in the upcoming year. I can't talk about it too much, but I'm really excited for you guys to see what I'm working on and where a lot of my energy and time has been going. But today I did wanna do a Where Is video. It's been a while since I've done one. And today I'm talking about a case that I have wanted to talk about for a really long time way even before I started my channel and started doing all of this honestly I have known about this case and really have been interested in it for a really long time I think you guys are gonna find this one to be very intriguing and you're gonna be really confused and just wondering wishing there was more answers at the end of it because it's truly one that just leaves you with so many possibilities that you almost feel overwhelmed at the end there have also been some newer updates the police have been focusing their investigation more on the family. So I'll tell you what I think about that, my honest thoughts, and we'll just get into everything in a sec here. But before we do that, we have another Where Is campaign. And I did wanna let you guys know that we have now hit the $50,000 mark. We're actually at 51,600. 95. Anyone can donate at any time via our team link below, but I also have more shirts for you guys if you would like to get something in return for your donation. I know a lot of people love to be able to buy something and have a percentage of the proceeds go to a charity. It's really nice. I mean, win-win, right? So this is the newest Thorn design. I thought this was really unique and looks very official. I feel like it does a good job of telling the story of Thorn, which is all about the rose and how the Thorn protects the rose and the rose is their symbol for or children in general. And this design was created by TJ Kinch. Thank you, TJ. I will link TJ's social media below. And again, 100% of the profit from that t-shirt goes directly to Thorn. So we don't make any money off of it and it's just a nice way to donate and also get the word out about Thorn by you wearing the shirts around. They're limited edition, so I only run them for a couple weeks. Keep that in mind. The link to purchase them will be below and it'll be through our new merch shop. So they're better quality now and hopefully the customer service experience is better for you guys and just everything is better. But let's get into today's case. Um, today we are talking about Mason Smith. Mason was a very beautiful looking guy, honestly. Look at his eyes, beautiful piercing blue eyes, blonde hair. He was 17 years old at the time living in Utah and he had five older siblings as well. But he was definitely thought of as the baby of the family and was a little bit coddled by his older siblings. He was a total mama's boy and everyone who took care of him would tell that to his mom. I thought it was interesting. She mentioned that all of her kids had said daddy first before they said mommy. And Mason was her first kid to say mommy first or mom. So he really loved his mom. And one thing that's really important to know about Mason is that when he was a child, he actually suffered from childhood aphasia. And aphasia is caused by delay in the speech development. And it sometimes makes it very difficult for people who have aphasia to be understood. And this is obviously really frustrating Mason definitely experienced this trying to communicate things to his parents early on that they couldn't understand what he was saying and he had an older sister who did kind of understand and would kind of translate for his mom but I think it was a struggle for him in the beginning uh, to not feel like he was being heard I think that really manifested in his life as he got older people would really bully him you know kids are mean and he just talked kind of different I mean it's similar to how someone who's hard of hearing or deaf may talk but it's kind of slowed and a little bit stretched out and it just sounds a little you know different than how other people speak so obviously kids don't understand what a disability is and a lot of kids will bully and it was really hard on his self-confidence he had speech therapy and the speech issues improved a lot over time but initially it was hard he ended up being a pretty quiet low-key reserved kids I mean everyone knows someone like that who's just kind of observing all the time and just never wants to step on anyone's toes and is just very chill overall. Another important thing here is that Mason's family had just moved to Utah and not only to Utah, to the United States. They had just moved from Canada. So huge change for Mason. They ended up moving to St. George, Utah, and it's a pretty small town. I mean, relatively, it's only about 80,000 people, but it's a really, really beautiful area. It's also very touristy and it's right on the border of Nevada. And at first Mason 
was hesitant to move because he only had one year of school left, but he never really had friends, which is terribly sad. He never really, really bonded with a friend super well. I mean, he would casually talk to people, like he had probably acquaintances, but I don't think his friendships went very deep outside of school and stuff. But he was still nervous to make the move, you know? It's still nerve wracking going in and meeting new people, seeing new faces, and he was at the end of his high school career, so he kind of felt like hesitant to leave. But he and his mom, Tracy, actually suffered from depression, and they think that some of it was because of where they were living. And they wanted a fresh start in a beautiful, scenic area. They believed that if they could get more sunshine, it would help, and I mean, it's true, it definitely makes a difference. Anyone else suffer from seasonal depression? So the plan was for Mason and his mom to move out there first. All of the other siblings were grown and moved on and he was the only one still living with his parents. And at first his father, Darren, uh, actually would come and visit Tracy and Mason out in Utah every once in a while because he had various construction projects so he'd kind of be there like on and off. But that time that they had together where it was just them, Tracy said was really great that they were able to bond a lot and they were already really close. I mean, they had a great relationship, but she felt like they got to spend some quality time together leading up to all of this and got to get outside and explore Utah, such a gorgeous state. And according to his mom, Mason was loving his life down in Utah. I mean, he loved the outdoor activities. He was really enjoying the scenic views that they had. They were hiking and doing all types of stuff. And he was really enjoying his new life. One bummer though was when they moved, not all of his credits transferred from his school. So he ended up having to do some summer credits to like get up to balance. And during his summer school, uh, he was actually really enjoying it. Tracy was working and enjoying her job. The weather was beautiful. He was enjoying his new school and new friends he was making. And overall, Mason was really happy. Now Mason being, you know, a pretty reserved guy, he was also really into being by himself and doing activities alone. He was a creative person. He would write music. He loved music, loved to listen to music and he also loved to play video games because a total escape from his life that's why most people play video games is it's a whole different world you turn on the game and you're immersed in this other world especially if you're on it all the time it's to the point where you feel like welcome back into the world that you like better you know in addition to his music and video games he also really loved anime like really into it was super super into it very comforted by it loved to watch movies and shows and if you don't really know what anime is it's a style of cartooning there's a lot of really dramatic plots a lot of deep stuff in there it's not just like cartoons you know it's it's pretty deep material and it can get dark some of it for sure and his parents said that at some points they felt like he was addicted to anime like it was just his other life so now we're gonna fast forward a little bit in time to monday august 31st 2015. that day mason was walking home from desert hills high school and he sent a text to his mother telling her that so far he was doing really well in school that he had all a's and his grades were good it was like only a couple weeks into the actual semester but so far so good is basically what his text was telling his mom and the reason he was telling her that is because they had this agreement that if he had had good grades he could watch anime that was essentially his reason for calling and telling her this so meanwhile back at home Darren Smith just got done working on a project in Salt Lake City so he had just gotten home a couple days prior and it's an interesting dynamic when it comes to Mason's parents I think his dad had a, a little more strict attitude towards everything versus Tracy was a little bit more motherly and understanding. I think a lot of people have this type of dynamic growing up and can relate to Mason in a lot of ways. One thing that's really interesting to note here though is Mason's dad was not religious. The rest of the family is Mormon and you know, they moved to Utah, but the father is agnostic, which really stood out to me because in my head, I was thinking maybe he's really religious and that's why he's strict because a lot of religious parents are strict, but I don't really know why he was strict. And I don't know like how strict he really was. I mean, there's a lot of questions about how life was and I feel like only Mason could like truly speak to how strict he felt his parents were, or his dad. So back to, that day, August 31st. Mason wanted to get home from school and get right on anime and just immerse himself in that, relax, you know? He's been killing it in school, really overwhelmed meeting all these new people, trying to adjust to this life, and he just wants to relax and 
escape into what he's into. And his dad immediately decided that he wanted to actually take him out for some driving practice. Uh, so we're not sure exactly how this conversation went down, of course, but essentially Mason told his dad that he felt like he had a headache and that he wanted to relax a little bit and rest and he didn't feel like he could drive. So they rescheduled it for a different time. They actually planned on doing it the next day. So they had made arrangements. He actually was kind of afraid of driving. He didn't really like the idea of driving. It's not like he was like thrilled to learn how to drive like a lot of teenagers are. And I really get that. I have major fear of driving anxiety when it comes to driving. And to be honest with you guys, I haven't driven in two years because of that. It's something I'm working on, but I mean, I understand Mason's fear of driving. I think a lot of you probably do. So later that night around 8.30 PM, Tracy got home from work and she comes in the house. It's all kind of quiet. And she ended up going into Mason's room and she said that he was just laying on his bed with the lights completely turned off. She asked if he was okay and he said he wasn't feeling very good. So she told him, you know, I hope you feel better, gave him a kiss goodnight, and then she just left the room. So then later that night around 10 p.m., Tracy decides to unplug the internet. Even though Mason had, you know, the good grades, he wasn't given complete access to internet. He had, you know, times that he was allowed to use it still. So she would actually unplug their modem and uh, normally would hide the cord as well. But this night in particular, she said she felt lazy and just left it out. So then later on that night, after her and Darren had gone to bed, Darren woke up and thought, you know what, I bet Mason went and got that cord and plugged the internet back in. I bet he's on his computer right now. So he got up and went to go check on Mason himself. And sure enough, as he's coming up to his door, he sees this like blue light under the door and he realizes, okay, yeah, he's on his computer. He opens the door and according to him, this wasn't like a major confrontation. He claims that Mason didn't fight back with him at all. And and I mean, I believe that Mason, it seems like a very, like I said, a chill type of guy. I don't think he normally would like throw a fit, you know, but he was angry. I mean, I'm not saying he wasn't upset, but according to his dad, Mason just closed his computer, handed over his phone, everything gave everything to him. Now, there's definitely been some speculation online. There's a lot of people that speculate about this case online and people are curious about how much the dynamic changed in the house when Darren was around. And like I said, I can't speak to how like strict of a parent he was or what Mason was feeling. I mean, no one can truly know how he felt other than him. But there's a lot of people who think that you know, when Darren was in town, that there was less video games, that there was just more pressure on him, that, you know, he felt a lot of pressure from his dad to get a job, that uh, his dad wanted him to be perfect maybe, like maybe he was feeling a lot of feelings about not being able to please his father or make him proud. So the next morning after they had all gone to bed, um, they'd actually joked about how Mason had gotten the cord and went back to bed and everything. And then the next morning around 7 a.m., the Smiths began their normal routine. Darren claims that he went and knocked on Mason's door just to make sure that he was getting ready. And then a little while later, they actually heard him getting ready. At around 7.30, they heard him in the kitchen, you know, having breakfast. And then 10 minutes later, Tracy heard the garage door close, which meant that Mason had walked to the bus stop, which is about two minutes away from their house. Now, one thing that is super important to note here is neither parent, Tracy or Darren, actually saw Mason that morning, that day at all. I mean, they heard him, they think he was getting ready in the house, but neither of them ever made contact with him or even saw him. So Tracy went to work like normal and Darren went to the gym that morning and then spent a bunch of time doing yard work. And then as afternoon came around, Darren started getting ready to take Mason on that driving lesson that they had planned. And Mason's bus usually dropped him off around 3.15 PM, you know, it kind of varies. But at 3.30 PM, Mason still wasn't home yet. And that was weird to Darren because the bus stop's only two minutes from their house. And Darren was getting really nervous because he took his cell phone from him the night before, which I get parents taking away phones. It sometimes needs to be done. I'm not a parent, but I can imagine it needs to be done sometimes. But like, it's really a shame when you need them and you took their phone and you can't get a hold of them. I mean, that's gotta be a crappy feeling. You guys are gonna hear some construction noises in this video, I think towards the end. There may not be anything I can do about it. We are having work done on the podcast studio today 
and they can't work around my filming schedule. So we're just gonna do our best here. They just got back from their lunch break. So Darren is obviously stressed out. So he ends up texting Tracy and tells her that Mason never came home. So at first Tracy thought, you know, he's probably still mad at us for what happened the night before uh, because Darren took his computer and phone away. Maybe he was just blowing off steam, you know, trying to chill a little bit before he came home. But then Tracy received an email from the school saying that Mason never came to school that day, which was super alarming for her. Tracy immediately headed home. And when they got home, they realized that Mason's bedroom door was actually locked. She said this was extremely weird for him and that he never locked his door. So she thought this is really odd. His parents were able to pick the lock pretty quick. I mean, it was a typical household door lock. Um, they went in his room and didn't find him and didn't find anything that looked out of the ordinary to them. So they ended up thinking that, you know, maybe there's a chance he went to youth group. He did belong to a church, to a youth group. So they checked with them. He wasn't there. So now they really didn't know what to do. Um, they figured, you know, maybe if he is blowing off steam, he'll probably come home by 10 PM because that's his curfew. But after his curfew came and went, they really got scared. So this is when they went ahead and called the police and filed a missing juvenile report. One police officer even told them that he was planning to just kind of cruise the area all night and just keep an eye out for Mason. And here's another critical piece of information. Mason had actually run away before. This was not the first time he had run away when they still lived in Canada. And it was pretty simple what happened in Canada. His grades were suffering, so his parents took away his Xbox completely and he ran away. He actually took some food with him and he took some resumes. Um, he was planning to get a job. He wasn't planning to come back. However, the particular night that he ended up running away was freezing cold outside. So he ended up coming right back home. So I think Tracy and Darren are starting to think, you know, this is round two of that and he'll come back. So September 2nd comes and they still have no sign of Mason, but they think he's run away and he's gonna come home. Tracy actually drove to a school that day and went in and paid for his cap and gown. It was his senior year. She figured, you know, he's gonna come back. He'll be graduating eventually, so I gotta get this done. And then she went home and continued searching in his room to see if she could find any clues. And that's when she discovered that his school stuff, like his binder and books and such, were on his closet floor under a bunch of clothes. It was obvious that he was trying to make it look like he took his school books and stuff. So his parents wouldn't question whether or not he went to school that day and he would have more time without them looking for him. And while Tracy was in his room, she ended up finding his wallet and his ID and stuff. And obviously if you're gonna run away, that's something that you're gonna wanna take with you. And this is when Tracy started to panic. She started to feel like maybe he didn't just leave. Maybe something bad is going on here. So this is when she called the rest of her family members and told them that he's missing. So as day three came along, the police finally decided to start looking further into this case you know, more than just a typical runaway juvenile. They thought it was really strange that he didn't take anything with him. Like he didn't have his phone, he didn't have his wallet, he didn't have his ID. Like how far can you get as a teenager without those things? They looked at his social media and they were able to confirm that there wasn't anything really happening on there, although he wasn't like a huge social media user by any means. So the police and Tracy are starting to question, you know, whether he even got on the bus that morning. And the school's telling them that he never made it to school, so chances are he didn't. And of course, when they went and interviewed the bus driver and the other kids, turns out Mason never got on the bus that day. So a few more days went by, and at this point, all of his brothers and sisters came into town to look for him. Everyone's fully freaking out, scared for him. The tone has very much shifted from runaway to maybe something happened to him. Was he kidnapped? I mean, your mind goes wild. They posted flyers everywhere in the community. The siblings really helped out and they even went to their church in Utah and new neighbors and people that they had all just met. They had just moved here and they were asking, you know, can you help us find Mason? And people were coming out and helping and being really friendly. So the neighborhood and the surrounding area started forming search parties. And after police started talking with people in the community, people did talk about seeing a man that looked like Mason who was holding a sign about five miles from their house on Interstate 15. And the sign said Las Vegas. So this definitely gave some hope to their family thinking maybe he went to Vegas, you know? It's only two hours away. Every teenager fantasizes about Las Vegas. And in that general area, there are multiple gas stations. So they hit up a bunch of gas stations like along the drive to see if maybe they had stopped at any of them, if they could get camera footage. They did get reports that there was already a man in Vegas that looked like Mason. Now Mason, when I say a man, I mean, he's big. He's 17, he's a minor, but he's big. He's like 6'4", 200 pounds. He's huge. 
So it's not like he's hard to miss. Eventually Darren decided that he was gonna go to Vegas himself and see if he could just find Mason. And he literally was walking the strip, looking for him, seeing if he recognized anyone that looked like him and he couldn't find anything. So he left with no leads as well. Crews hit the streets again tonight, searching for a missing Utah teenager who may be here in our valley. 17 year old Mason Smith went missing more than a week ago from St. George, Utah. Members of Mason's family think he could be somewhere along I-15 between Salt Lake City and Las Vegas. St. George police have received tips that Smith was seen holding a sign reading hitchhiking to Vegas the day he went missing. Red Rock Search and Rescue has deployed several missions looking for him. Mason, if, if you're watching this, one, you're not in trouble, okay? We're here to help you. Your family's not mad at you. They miss you. They want you to come home. Mason has blonde hair, blue eyes, is 6'4", and weighs about 200 pounds. If you think you've seen him, please call the police. A Red Rock Search and Rescue is wrapping up their search in Utah. A team of volunteers spent the last few days in St. George looking for missing teen Mason Smith. The 17-year-old disappeared almost a month ago. He was last seen along the highway with a sign that read hitchhiking to Las Vegas. Meanwhile, back at home, Tracy's sister had actually figured out how to get into Mason's YouTube account, like figured out his password and stuff. And when they got on there, they realized that he had purposely just deleted his history. They also went through his phone, but they weren't able to find anything out of the ordinary. Eventually they gave the detectives his phone and laptop to be looked into more. We've definitely never seen this, but apparently when they looked into it more, they found a Word document and it was written by Mason. And apparently in this document, Mason had talked about wanting to try to hurt himself. The family was able to obtain some of that gas station footage um, and they were able to determine that the guy that was holding the sign saying Vegas was not Mason, uh, similar looking, but not him. Then a few days later, not till September 7th, his mom ended up discovering a folded up note in his wallet, which I honestly can't believe police missed that. Somehow they looked at his wallet and stuff and missed that. But anyway, now this letter has been super controversial across the internet. No one, and I repeat, no one knows what this says no one has any idea exactly what it says. There's been some parts that have been confirmed by family. Like for example, his mom said in the letter, he actually said the words, I'm done. This was a very personal and intense letter that was very upsetting for Mason, I'm sure to write and not something that I think he would want everyone on the internet reading. Uh, so I think it's a good decision that they've decided to keep this private. A lot of people are angry about it and think that there's reasons that his parents have kept it secret, you know, other reasons, but it was, him basically talking about his internal conflict with feeling like he was never good enough. He felt like he was really frustrated with his parents trying to control his every move and feeling like he was disappointing them. And in the letter, he specifically talked about how much it hurt that they took away his electronics. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this. You know, he was saying, I escape to my anime. This is how I relax. And when you take this away from me, it's depressing. It makes me angry. And I think he felt really out of control feeling like, okay, I'm an adult. I'm going into senior year and I'm I'm getting good grades, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to, and I'm still having my internet shut off at 10. Like, I feel like he felt extremely suffocated in a way. I understand taking your kid's internet and taking their devices, of course. I mean, it has to be done, like I said, but when they're doing good in school and they're doing everything they're asking you to do, I'm sure it feels pretty frustrating as a kid, feeling like, okay, there's no way for me to, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm gonna be controlled. Especially when, you know, he's about to be 18, He's gonna be leaving the house soon. Um, I think he thought maybe he would have more of a transition period. And I think he was upset with the way that it was starting to turn out, especially with his dad around. The letter wasn't written to anyone specific and it didn't have a date. So they're not sure exactly when he wrote this. Police thought it was really strange that the letter was hidden too. Like if you had written a goodbye letter or a suicide note, uh, you'd probably leave it somewhere in plain sight. And police ended up finding out that about two years prior to all of this, Mason actually was hospitalized for depression. He was having a really, really hard time and he was in the hospital about a week. So police and his family started trying to think about what would he have done if he wanted to hurt himself? There weren't any weapons in the house, so police 
started to feel like maybe he took his own life outside somewhere. And especially in this area, St. George, where they lived, there was a lot of cliffs and like high areas that he could jump off of and easily end his life. So they searched all the nearby areas at the bottom of these cliffs and nothing was found. So several days later, police ended up getting a tip from one of the Smith's neighbors. She said that on the Tuesday afternoon that Mason went missing, around 3.15 p.m., she was actually out around their neighborhood dropping her daughter off at a friend's house and she just saw Mason and walking down the street and she knew him from church. She was pretty positive that it was him. She said that he was walking in the opposite direction of his house. And if this is true, this would mean she saw him nearly eight hours after his parents originally thought he had left for school. Is it possible he was still in the house, he hadn't left yet, that he was waiting until his parents were gone for the day or doing whatever they were doing and was waiting to leave. Maybe he was hiding in the neighborhood somewhere, waiting to leave, thinking out his plan. I mean, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but it's an interesting tip. So weeks passed and there was still no sign of Mason. The Red Rock search and rescue team actually went to the outskirts of St. George to try to help look for Mason. They brought dogs, horses, and they ended up searching over 40 square miles of the surrounding desert. But despite this, they were not able to find anything. So as time went on, there was a Facebook page created to help look for Mason. And when you get a bunch of people on the internet talking about the same topic, there's bound to be some hearsay and rumors. And there's a lot of talk on there about Mason possibly being gay. Maybe that's why he didn't feel accepted into his life. I mean, he was at the Mormon church. Maybe he was not connecting with his dad for that reason. And maybe he took his own life or left because of that. And so. I mean, it's an interesting theory, but it's complete speculation. Tracy didn't really agree with this. She said, you know, even if he is gay or he was, then it wouldn't have made a difference to us. And she felt like he knew that, or I mean, she probably hoped that he knew that. And again, it's pure speculation. No one has any idea what Mason's sexuality was. You know, he certainly didn't talk about it anywhere. Eventually his parents went ahead and announced a um, $10,000 reward. And as time went on, one theory that the police and Tracy sort of hung on to really was that Mason was just gonna show up around his 18th birthday. You know, maybe he felt like, okay, once I'm 18, there's no more rules. There's no more telling me when to shut the internet off. And then, you know, he can do whatever he wants when he's 18. Maybe he was waiting to come back. So they were waiting up until his 18th birthday. Tracy even held an event on his birthday to raise awareness, hoping that, you know, maybe he would show up. However, time continued after his 18th birthday and there was still no sign of him. And there wasn't any new tips or leads until July of 2016, 11 months after he had disappeared, a new tip came in. The tip said that Mason was seen at a Panda Express restaurant up in West Valley, Utah, and two sisters apparently were eating there and they saw a man sitting at a table across from them and he ended up getting up and approached them and asked if he had any change so that he could ride the bus. The girl said that he was really polite and they felt bad for him so they gave him all the change that they had. Later on the girls um, were telling their mom about it and their mom actually knew about the Help Find Mason Smith Facebook page and ended up showing it to them and said did he look anything like this and they said oh my god yes looked exactly like him and he even had a bit of a speech issue going on they described it as slurred speech. So of course, police went to the Panda Express, asked for their camera footage, and of course it wasn't working. But somehow, eventually police were able to confirm that that person was not Mason. And not having any answers was just really devastating on the family. I mean, as you can imagine, the mental toll of not having any idea what happened to your family member. I mean, did they run away? Did they kill themselves? Did something happen to them? I mean, the things that would go through your mind. It's like endless torture. I can't imagine how you'd sleep at all. Tracy kept on his phone service for a while and she said that she did that because, you know, he knew his phone number and that maybe she thought he would call his own phone. Uh, one day, you know, maybe it was the only thing he had actually memorized and then eventually when years passed She eventually did end of the service for it and turned the phone off Red Rock search and rescue is still looking for Mason Smith But as of right now Mason is still missing to this day And there are many theories as you can imagine of what could have happened So one theory is actually brought forward by his mom and that it's that Mason moved to California and there's some interesting details here apparently California was a place that Mason really liked and he'd always talk about how he'd love to live like the surfer, beach bro, beach bum lifestyle. His family would take trips out to California all the time and his parents even met in California. And so he always had a special bond with the state and 
This is really interesting, but according to Tracy, Mason had talked about wanting to move to California. He said, do you ever wish you could just drop everything and move to California and start over? Now looking back, this is really interesting that he said this. He said that sometimes he felt like he would just leave and go to California one day. And she said at this time, she took it sarcastically and she laughed and said, you know, let me know when you do. And to her surprise, he responded and said, I probably wouldn't. And there was a family friend who actually came forward saying that Mason actually told them the exact same thing. He said he had mentioned specifically that he wanted to be free and not be tied down to anyone's rules. So many people believe that Mason hitchhiked to California and that he's still out there. California has obviously a huge population. I mean, a huge population of homeless people as well, which is definitely something you think about with these cases. Could Mason be homeless and wandering the streets and maybe he's confused. What could have happened to him since he left the house? You know, you think about that, but just the amount of people that are in the state, I mean, it would be easy to blend in there. And you know, there's a lot of other theories about Maybe he ran away to other places or to Vegas or who knows where he went and could have gone to Mexico. I mean, there's just a huge theory that he left on his own, that he planned it out ahead of time and decided to leave everything behind so that he couldn't be traced. I mean, it's just a theory. No one knows for sure, but it's very possible that Mason Smith is out there. I mean, I literally thought about the fact that Mason Smith could watch this video and just not want to come home. I mean, there are people that leave and don't want to come back and they get found and they're like, leave me alone. I wanted to stay hidden. He could be anywhere. I mean, that's why I felt like it was so important to cover this case again and get his face out there to a new group of people. I mean, anyone could see him on the streets. And like I said in the beginning of the video, he's a very unique looking person. He's really tall, blonde, he's piercing blue eyes. I mean, you could see him for sure, if you live in California, especially. And then there's theories that his parents could have done something. And this is definitely something that is hard for me to talk about because I feel weird about this personally, but there's, definitely theories that his parents could have done something. It's not really at Tracy at all. It's all really towards Darren. And Darren hasn't been as like public about everything. Like he wasn't in the recent Disappeared show that they did with um, ID Discovery. He wasn't part of that. And I felt like that was a missed opportunity for him to like connect with people. Cause I feel like I can't make a determination on him just to be honest. Not that I can through TV interviews anyway, but I do my best to try to see what I think about people's character. And you can tell a lot by an interview. You can really tell a lot. I feel like I got a good read on Tracy and I feel like she was a good mother. She's a good person, but because I didn't really get to watch a lot of Darren, I can't really speak too much about what I think about him. You know, I don't feel like I got to know either way how he's feeling about all this. I mean, it'd be interesting to hear him talk about that day in his own words. Now, over the years, there have actually been court documents that have stated that maybe Mason was murdered. There are several warrants out that say that the police are collecting evidence and trying to investigate. And some of the warrants actually raise questions about the actions and statements from Mason's parents. This has been like kind of a newer development. There's been like articles about it this year that the police are now focusing their investigation on the parents. There seems like there's been a major shift. There are allegations that his parents didn't help with the search parties. And they also claim that they made some inconsistent statements. And the police ended up being so worried about this recently, they ended up putting a 60 day GPS tracker on Darren's truck without his permission. I mean, they do this and tracked his every move uh, and tried to see if they could find anything. And when Darren found out that he had been being surveilled, he said, you know, good, I'm glad. I hope that this clears up anything. You know, I don't mind. I have nothing to hide essentially. Follow me all you want. But authorities have made statements that no one is considered a suspect right now, but the police do have people that they describe as people of interest. And they say that they could have more information that they could be withholding about what could have happened. There's one part of the timeline that investigators are having trouble with. And I will say it doesn't make a lot of sense. If you remember, I mentioned that Darren ended up going to the gym that morning. He actually went to Vasa Fitness and a search warrant from December, 2016 says that after Mason reportedly left for school, Darren's membership card was used to check in at Vasa Fitness around 7.45 AM, but Mason's bus was scheduled to pick him up at 7.41 a.m. According to police, the Smiths only live about 10 minutes away from the gym. So a lot of people have questioned the timeline and what they've said 
happened that morning. Some people question like, how was he able to hear him getting ready and like hear him leaving the house if he was already at the gym? Also, police spoke with a retired detective who had worked with the family initially on searching for him. And he reported that he had conversations with Mason's father and apparently he had specifically told him that he hadn't heard Mason leave that day. And apparently Darren said that he felt like there was no way he could have gone missing during the night. But I don't really know how much this shows of anything, you know? One thing that police specifically did note, however, is that during the searches on the 26th and the 27th of September, they claim that that day, neither Tracy or Darren showed up or even called to see how the searches were going and they thought that this was odd. However, there are literally video clips shot by local news that shows the parents like huddled with other volunteers in the cold under blankets. I mean, they were out there searching for sure. They claim that on that specific weekend, the 26th, 27th, they were told not to come search because they could possibly be the one to find their son's body. And that's just horrible. I mean, no one wants that. So they specifically told them not to participate. It makes total sense. Now, from the beginning, Darren and Tracy both agreed to participate, you know, fully, and they did um, polygraph tests. And Tracy claims that they passed them both. However, the police have not confirmed this, you know, either way. And the police are still saying the case is under investigation. Back in 2018, they had another physical search for Mason with about a hundred local volunteers, but they did not find anything. And at this point, the social media around Mason is just huge. I mean, there's 50,000 people on the Facebook page for Mason. Um, people really want to know what happened to him. I think this is one of those cases that stays with people and sticks in their mind. Where is Mason Smith? Is he alive? What happened? Like there's so many questions. There was a bench made for Mason at a local park and it's inscribed with the words, never give up never surrender and the bench was placed just about a block and a half from where he went missing and it overlooks the red rocks that he loved i'm hoping that those who feel alone will now have something to connect with and know that they aren't alone in their struggles now, tracy smith you just heard from her there says the last three or four months or so they've been working on this memory bench in honor of her son she says it is giving them something to cherish and to love and a place to sit and ponder life and chat with Mason or share his story with someone who may not know. Four years, it, it doesn't seem possible. Despite countless searches and international interest in Mason's disappearance, his family is still seeking answers. I wish I could get answers, not just for me, but for my my family to have closure. While the investigation remains an active missing persons case, police said they've exhausted every lead without any evidence of Mason's whereabouts. And in the event of foul play, no one is being considered as a potential suspect. You know, I was talking to my daughter yesterday and she says, I can't imagine going through my whole life not knowing where my brother is. Today, she said there's a silver lining on a Facebook group with nearly 50,000 members known as Mason's Army, where other families with missing loved ones can share information about possible leads and whereabouts. The Smiths actually got divorced in May of 2018, which is interesting for sure. They were married for more than 30 years, but I'd be curious to see if there's any change in his mom's interviews or like if she has anything more to say now that they're not together. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm just curious. Both of them have since gotten remarried or engaged to get remarried. They both still live in Utah. Um, Tracy lives in the Washington County area and Darren lives in Salt Lake City, but uh, they recently did a final search for Mason. They actually called this their final search and they said that they need to move on, which I understand, I understand. But Tracy Smith says that she will never give up on her son. I mean, it's her child. She's never going to fully stop. And you know, she's really thankful for everyone that keeps talking about the case and keeps looking for Mason and keeps keeps him in their thoughts, really. Tracy hopes that if anything good comes from this is that the police department learns how to deal with disappearances better. They, she thinks that they've already improved since his disappearance, so she says that's good. Again, this is one of those cases where it truly does matter for you to memorize this face. This is Mason Smith. It's spelled M-A-C-I-N. He is six feet, four inches tall and weighs 200 pounds. He has light blue eyes and short blonde hair. This is the way he looked when he went missing, but keep in mind he could change, his hair could grow. Just keep an eye out. If you do have any information and you would like to get that to the right people, you can contact the St. George Police. I'll leave their phone number below. This case is just really, really odd. I don't know what to make of it at the end of the day. If you want my theory, I think he ran away. I think Mason left. I think he 
planned it out. I think he was really smart actually and very calculated and you know, some of the most reserved and quiet people are sometimes the people that have the most going on in their head. And I personally think that he just wanted to start a new life and wanted to reinvent everything and that he doesn't want to be found. You know, you think, why wouldn't you just tell your family you're alive somewhere and you're okay so that they can have some peace? But like, he knows that he can't tell them that without them ever stopping looking for him. Like if they find out that he's still alive, if he tells them that, it's just gonna reignite search efforts and start everything. So he knows that as much as it's painful for everyone else, it's your right as a human being to have freedom to leave like that. It's sad, uh, it's terrible. And you know, I, I hope that's what happened. I hope it wasn't something else. I truly feel like he left though. But I don't know. I'm really curious about your opinions on this one. I know it's a difficult one for sure and there's some difficult topics here. We're talking about mental health and some heavy issues uh, that I'm sure a lot of you can relate to, Mason, in a lot of ways. But share your thoughts and feelings with me in the comments below. That's it for me today, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to give it a thumbs up on your way out if you did and be sure to subscribe and turn on your notifications if you haven't already. But that's it for me today, guys. I hope you're having a great day and I will see you next time. Where'd you go? Have you so? Seems like it's been forever that you've been gone. Where'd you go?